Hello, my name is Don Schnitzler. I'm a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. And on behalf, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to our last uh, webinar for 2021. Uh, tonight's program is titled Alda Leopold's Land Ethic, a Product of Perception. It will be presented by Steve Swenson, uh, who is the director of the Alda Leopold Foundation in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Over the past 20 years, uh, Steve's career has advanced the ethical relationship between people and land through tangible conservation initiatives. He oversees the education and stewardship programs of the foundation, which include Aldo Leopold's historic shack, a national historic landmark. Regionally, Steve helps lead a public-private partnership called My Wisconsin Woods. Uh, through continuous improvement of outreach methods, My Wisconsin Woods inspires land care among previously engaged, uh, previously unengaged landowners. For this project and others, Steve authored regional handbooks titled My Healthy Woods, written specifically for inexperienced landowners. These award-winning handbooks have reached over 40,000 landowners collectively owning 6 million acres of land in Arkansas, Minnesota, New Jersey, Iowa, and of course, Wisconsin. Steve holds a BS degree in environmental science from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, and a master's degree in ecology from the Ohio State University. Before I hand the program over to Steve, just a couple little housekeeping items. Tonight, as you listen to the program, if you have questions, we ask that you note the question in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then at the end of the conference or at the end of the presentation, those questions will be given to Steve to answer. If you have any problems during the webinar uh, and you need to talk to either Tom or I, also enter those comments into the chat feature and we will get back to you to try to help solve any issues. And then after tonight's webinar, there will be a brief survey sent to you. We hope that you will take a few minutes to, to fill that in and provide us some feedback so that we can improve the 2022 webinar series starting next month. And with that, Steve, I'm gonna turn this all over to you. Uh, thank you, Don. That was very nice. Uh, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, Tom, thank you for making sure the technology is all working. I'm going to see if I can do my part and make it work. There we go. Uh, well, this is great. Uh, we, we have done some forestry work in Wisconsin, um, uh, across Wisconsin now for about the last six or seven years. Uh, but that project got piloted in Southwest Wisconsin in the Driftless area, working with private landowners. And so I imagine there's a few private landowners in the audience here that own some woodlands. Um, and so I'll, part of my presentation hopefully will connect with you. But Leopold himself uh, got his start, of course, in forestry. And I'll go through that history as well. But safe to say that um, without this little number here, a Sand County Almanac, you probably would never have heard of, of Aldo Leopold. Uh, it was his masterpiece. Uh, it was his finest writing. Uh, he was extremely proud of what he had pulled together. And I'm going to start with reading from a Sand County Almanac and some of the beautiful writing. Uh, this is from the Marshland Elegy essay in Wisconsin. A dawn wind stirs on the great marsh. With almost imperceptible slowness, it rolls a bank of fog across the wide morass. Like the white ghost of a glacier, the mists advance, riding over phalanxes of tamarack, sliding across bog meadows heavy with dew. A single silence hangs from horizon to horizon. Out of some far recess of the sky, a tinkling of little bells falls soft upon the listening land. Then again, silence. Now comes a bane of some sweet-throated hound, soon the clamor of a responding pack, then the far clear blast of hunting horns out of the sky into the fog. High horns, low horns, silence. And finally, a pandemonium of trumpets, rattles, croaks, and cries that almost shakes the bog with its nearness, but without yet disclosing whence it comes. At last, a glint of sun reveals the approach of a great echelon of birds. On motionless wing, they emerge from the lifting mists, sweep a final arc of sky, 
and settle in clangorous descending spirals to their feeding grounds. A new day has begun on the Crane Marsh. That is really beautiful writing. Like the white ghost of a glacier, the mists advance. It's a wonderful simile. Well, the other thing that Leopold did in his writing, um, and as a scientist, this was a big move, was to show some emotion for the land and to use words like love. We can only be ethical in relation to something that we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. And that was stepping outside the bounds of um, sort of his comfort zone as a scientist, as somebody who had this um, manager and pragmatic view of the land. But that really brought um, out, I think, for him, some definition of sustainability. And so I'm going to frame my talk tonight uh, with this notion of sustainability, that we won't have it until we have a healthy environment, a healthy society, and a healthy economy. And when all three of those come together, uh, we have really achieved something that we can find to be sustainable over time. So I'm going to start with the environment uh, and where Leopold grew up. So in 1887, uh, he's born in a river town, Burlington, Iowa. Um, so he is this, a son of Iowa, but uh, Wisconsin likes to claim him. So does uh, New Mexico, and we'll get to that history as well. Uh, but born in 1887, he was the first of four children. He was the eldest and clearly, clearly his mother's favorite. And all the kids knew it. Um, and it embarrassed Aldo a little bit, but uh, I think he also felt like he did stand out among his siblings. Uh, in particular, because he had this really strong relationship with uh, multiple generations in his family, he had a very close relationship with his grandpa. Uh, they did what they called in that time woodscraft, which was going out and enjoying nature, uh, studying what they saw. Uh, by age 11, he had recorded 39 birds in his uh, composition book, and here's a drawing that he did at, at a very young age. Uh, their setting, uh, where their house was, this has been preserved, by the way, down in Burlington, uh, but the big house was right on the, on, on the Mississippi River, um, overlooking, you can kind of see it in that picture there with the bridge uh, in the background, and they called it Luggins Land, which meant looking to the land, and he would take tromps uh, down to the river's edge, uh, again, going on nature hikes, it was, it was a passion of his, um, kind of on a daily basis. His mother had a more refined uh, approach to life and wanted to make sure that he was well-rounded. So she insisted that he take dance class. Uh, she also liked it that they took summer trips and had long vacations up in the Laysheno Islands, which was a slightly hoity-toity um, uh, community of people out on big houses on a small island up there in Lake Huron. Uh, but that was his mother's influence. His father's influence, uh, Carl Leopold, uh, he was a hunter and he was a sportsman. He was very much in the spirit of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you can even sort of see it in that picture with the gun and the dog and the big mustache, uh, reminiscent of Roosevelt. Uh, the picture on the right side of the screen there is a very um, exclusive hunting club that was just over the Mississippi River from where they lived. And the kids, the boys would always fight on who got to go with dad over there. They would swap pocket knives or uh, give up other uh, prized possessions to get a chance to go with that over to the hunt club. And the picture of there with Leopold with a, a stringer of fish is from the Lachino Islands uh, and his dog um, Spud, which got nicknamed Spudo after Aldo. But they had this ethic that was developing in their family. Um, so you can imagine there weren't a lot of game laws back then. And in fact, very few, if any, depending on where you lived. Um, and one of the big reasons why uh, passenger pigeons went from a billion to none uh, was they didn't have the laws to protect that species. But they had their own rules in their family. So Carl, uh, his father, uh, never load your gun before sunrise. We're going to make sure we have double barrel guns so that we have a second shot in case we wound an animal. Uh, they were not going to hunt species that were decreasing in numbers. And there were no spring hunting during breeding season. And we're not going to use decoys and feed or live baits. And so um, this ethic uh, was, was brewing in Aldo as he was growing up. Uh, his father really wanted him to take over the family business. And so there was the Leopold Best Company, 
This was a family business that got started by the previous generation. So, so this would have been Aldo's grandfather that started this company and um, was hoping that the next generation would take it on, which they did, uh, Carl and the Rand family. Um, Carl Leopold and the Rand family took this business on and he was hoping that uh, Aldo would take over the business one day. And by the way, I think in one of the teasers that I, I had um, for the program tonight, uh, there was a question about, well, what's Aldo's real first name? So it is not Aldo Leopold. Aldo is not his first name. That is his middle name. And because um, we, we don't have a live session here where we can see in the chat, but um, his real first name is Rand. And it was named after in honor of this other family, but then there was a falling out. And so from then on, he was referred to as Aldo. But their business was built on wood and the Mississippi was a major artery for transportating, uh, transportation of wood. Um, and so they paid attention and they saw that these rafts of wood were getting smaller and smaller and they were reading about the Northern Pineries in Wisconsin getting cut over. And all these discussions around the dinner table inadvertently led Aldo to become more interested in forestry. So Aldo's father, Carl, really wanted him to go to a state school in, for college in Iowa and really just thought that was good enough for, for Aldo and the family. His mother, on the other hand, Clara, uh, she was really interested in him getting a boarding education out, in, out east somewhere. And she went out and he ended up going out on a train to Lawrenceville in New Jersey. And this is where the writing began. People want to know, how does someone come to write as beautifully as what's in a Sand County Almanac? And it's just the same as you, you need to do to get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. So he is writing letters to his mother daily. And these are not about having a ham sandwich for lunch and I met this you know, a friend. Uh, these are about his, his adventures around campus. And I'm going to read to you this letter that's on the screen here. And he's writing this at age, uh, would have been uh, about 17 or so. Another Sunday has come around and brought with it an ever increasing change in the progress of spring. It may be idle to announce to you who are having an extraordinary season that hepaticas, bloodroots, saxifrage, and dandelions are blooming. But to see here the first flowers means a great deal just as it did to you a week ago. On the whole, my yesterday's tramp was very remarkable. It was a typical April day of scurrying clouds alternated by glimpses of bright blue with bursts of the most grateful sunshine followed by cold, dark, and windy periods. My quest of the first kingfisher has not yet ceased, so to Stony Brook was the only choice. And well it was, too, for although the one blue-coated fisherman still tanned in the sun, sunny Southland, another had taken his place, as I soon saw by the profusion of footprints along the muddy shores. I think my mom's in the audience here. I did write my mother letters from college, but they did not sound like that. So after Lawrenceville, um, uh, Leopold is in the fifth graduating class coming out of Yale. And this is a, you know, the Yale Forestry School started by Pinchot family. And uh, his sign off in the yearbook was to hell with convention. So I don't have to tell you which one is Aldo Leopold in this picture, but the gray suit in the front row gives it away. Uh, he was independent um, during school. He got the nickname as the shark uh, because he was very focused and kind of pretty serious guy, very focused on his academics, um, but less so on the academics and more focused on just getting into nature and spending time uh, out in the wilds. And so there were some times in his, in his college career where he wasn't doing so well in school, um, but he nonetheless was a pretty serious guy all around. And this, this came to, to bite him as he got his first job. And so he was a forest assistant uh, at age 22. He's in the Southwest part of the country, uh, Arizona, New Mexico. And their duties as part of his jobs were to preserve a perpetual supply of timber, prevent destruction of forest cover and protect, protect local industries from unfair competition. All forestry, pretty sound related uh, uh, tasks there. And 
that work went fairly well, but there were some real issues with uh, what he was what he was working on in terms of um, the detail to to uh, the, the attention to detail in his work and in the reconnaissance that they were doing. Uh, meanwhile, he is um, spending time in town and he meets Estella Brigier. And he'd get a few days in town and then, and then during the work week, he'd have to go back out into the field and do reconnaissance. And so he was away from Estella and he would write her letters. And he very quickly became very fond of her. And yet there was another gentleman that was seeking her affections in town. And he too was uh, pressing hard for her attention and so Aldo's getting a little bit nervous. He's writing letters back to her um, and they're not being responded to. And so one of his final letters is, is I'm coming to town on Friday for my answer. And he is gonna ask her for her hand in marriage. And she said, yes. So in 1912, they got married. Uh, and then over the next 12 years or so, uh, they had four children and really got established in um, Albuquerque uh, and had a, had a nice uh, family that they were raising there. But there was this nagging thing in Aldo's mind about that really was sprung out of his, his days as a youth and spending time in the field with family uh, pursuing wild game. And so he goes to his uh, supervisor in 1915 and proposes some new policies. And this is, you know, mid 20s. He's, he, Consider game animals as forest products, manage wild species for count and quality, set up some game refuges with hunting permits that could be sold and use the profits to pay for predator control and enforce state game laws. And his forest supervisor says, no, no. Your work out in the field on the reconnaissance, you've been off on some of your numbers. Um, this, this game thing, this ain't gonna fly. You need to be spending your time making sure that you're paying attention to uh, the forest products, the timber products that we expect to come off and serve our local businesses. And so the answer is no. So the second proposal didn't go over so well. So he goes a different direction. And meanwhile, uh, the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and others are starting these game protective associations because they know if there is nothing to shoot at, there's no reason to buy shells. Um, and so they start up these American Game Protective Associations and Leopold helped start one in New Mexico. He even scored a letter of recognition from Theodore Roosevelt and that's in the lower left on the screen there, which was a big uh, deal to a family that um, uh, really um, uh, was reverent toward uh, Theodore Roosevelt as a president and also somebody who uh, loved nature. And they started to show some success. So by 1920, uh, they were very proud to attend the American Game Conference. And there they, um, they were talking about their predator control. And in just three years, they had gone from a population of 300 wolves in New Mexico to 30. And that was very good news to everybody that they shared there that this predator control was happening. Uh, and you can see some of the pelts that were hanging there down below. Uh, maybe there's one hunter in there that didn't get one. It looks like the guy from the second from the right is not very happy. Well, I'm going to step away from the Leopold history for just a moment and talk about our environment around uh, the historic site, Leopold Shack down here in Baraboo, Wisconsin, where the Legacy Center is located. And we are part of an important bird area. An important bird area program is international. There are thousands of them around the world. Uh, we have 90, uh, some of them in Wisconsin, but these are the best places in Wisconsin uh, for bird diversity and importance to birds uh, for migration, uh, as well as uh, where they're breeding. And we're one of them. Here is um, a graphic of where they all exist in Wisconsin. You can see some along the uh, Lake Michigan shore there uh, for the shorebirds and the migration, uh, but also just um, big natural areas that you might recognize around the state. Some of those are um, primarily owned by one entity like the Horicon Marsh would be federal and state or uh, Mesita Wildlife Refuge, federal. Uh, but then there's some others like down in Sauk County here, the big green blob in the middle of our county uh, is uh, the Baraboo Hills owned by many private landowners and ours is just north of there along the Wisconsin River. Ours is made up of state, federal, 
and private nonprofit as well as private landowner property. And it's about 11,000 acres in size. And what we did uh, as part of establishing this, of course, we had to have data to go with it. Um, it this is the seal of approval for the most important places for birds in Wisconsin. And so we needed to develop that data set. And so you can see the little white hash marks on the screen or across the map here. At each one of those, we did a five minute listening session. There was 230 of them. And we found out what birds are breeding there. Uh, we suspected that we had uh, certain types and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but we ended up with 108 different breeding species there half of which are on some list for conservation need. So I don't know if you've been following uh, the plight of, of birds across North America, but we have lost 3 billion birds uh, since 1970. And in particular, grassland species, savanna species are in very, very steep decline. 30% of their populations have been lost in the last 30 years. And so as we chose our 25 priority bird species and thought about our land and what it can do best, we ended up um, picking grassland and savanna species because our land uh, is very, very sandy down here. We're on the outwash of the Glacial Lake, Wisconsin and the, and the Wisconsin River floodway. And so we're on very, very deep deposits of sand, very poorly, uh, very poor soils, uh, very well drained. And so we end up with bobolink, red-headed woodpecker, sparrows of all sorts, grasshopper sparrows in the picture here on the upper right. Uh, but then we also have a special place for cranes. Um, and so they're on our list uh, because we provide a traditional staging area for them in the fall. Uh, we had about 10,000 to 15,000 come through this year, uh, offer tours for people to see them. But we really started to use birds not only um, as, as a target for conservation, because if we can help these birds, that is a good thing. But these birds also tell us about the land and what's happening on it. And so we were able to uh, produce maps like this. Um, and in this central area here, this is the DNR property. This is about 6,000 acres total. And in the middle here is a huge thousand acre grassland that they maintain and have done a lot of prescribed fire there and prairie plantings. And the data would suggest that they have been doing a very good job. Uh, those are all hits on grassland bird species. Um, and what was interesting is here's the Leopold Memorial Reserve, you know, and we're always in the newspaper for doing great conservation work uh, in the spirit of Aldo Leopold. And we didn't get that many hits. You know, and I had been out there planting prairie, uh, doing a lot of prescribed fire. You know, I really thought that some of these restorations back in here. Uh, would have uh, a lot of hits for grassland birds and they didn't. And what it told us is we were not working holistically enough across this land. I was so worried and focused on what was happening on this acre that I wasn't thinking about what was happening between these acres that we were restoring. And so we've had a much better vision. Birds have helped us see the land as a whole and, and uh, uh, discover new techniques that we need to develop uh, in order to manage the land, like breaking open corridors between uh, grasslands so that it effectively is one big grassland and not these smaller postage size. And then here's another wonderful story that came out of this is the private landowner across the, the river. This is about 2000 acres of private ownership, one of the largest owners in Columbia County. And there are a lot of hits on grassland birds. He had no idea what he was doing for conservation uh, until this map was shown to him and he was super excited uh, to be included in this important bird area and to see uh, that his conservation work, although at that time sort of subconsciously was doing good work for um, uh, conservation and, and uh, of grassland birds. And so we've carried on with that work and really it's been a nice thing to pull together the neighborhood uh, in a collective effort for conservation, not just about the birds, but about how we're managing holistically across all those properties for many different species. Getting back to Aldo Leopold, so he's running into this, um, this issue that, you know, his forest supervisor is not allowing him to sort of spread his wings and get into game management on the forest, uh, the national forest lands down there. And he's also running into some health issues. And so his forest supervisor had been suggesting for years that he moved back to the Midwest, where he's from, uh, the, the, the climate is a little bit more mild, um, he can take care of his health, spend more time with family, and he can be part of the Forest Products Lab, which is also, of course, part of the Forest Service. 
and he could get the uh, assistant directorship there and the new and the director, the current director was uh, set to retire in a few years and so he could take over the directorship. Well, he lasted there for a few years and he liked this idea of the utility of wood and making better use of wood. But again, game management just kept popping up. And so this opportunity to do game surveys across the Midwest for the Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute, SAMI, uh, was presented to him and he took it. And so he started doing game surveys across uh, six states, or seven states, sorry, and produced this game survey. And he is now being recognized by his colleagues across the country as one of the leading voices for wildlife management. And one of the really important things, and I know people in the audience will find this to be just like, doesn't everybody know this, but at the time people did not know this, is, and I'll read from, from his uh, report to um, the committee, the one and only thing we can do to raise a crop of game is to make the environment more favorable. It is the fundamental truth that the conservation movement must learn if it is to attain its objective. So this idea of habitat management was not widely, was not widely understood. Certainly it was not widely practiced. And so he is being called to meetings to, to share this novel idea uh, with, um, with uh, folks from all across the country that are interested in game management. He's also starting to take this platform and turn it into an opportunity to start creating an ethic. And so this is, this is another part of his report. The public is, and the sportsman ought to be, just as interested in conserving non-game species, forest, fish, and other wildlife, as in conserving game. And so he saw his opportunity to, again, create this whole vision uh, for how we take care of the land and care for the many species on it. So in 32 and 33, he writes game management. Again, he is seen as one of the leading experts across the country on game management and yet does not have a job. So at this point in 1933, he is jobless. He is, he is um, cashing in his stock in the Leopold Desk Company in order to put uh, food on the table for his young family. And these prominent citizens in Madison get together and they pull together enough money, benefactors of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, pull together enough money to support his position and get it started. And he becomes the first position of its kind in the world for game management at a university. Which gets us into another aspect of the triple bottom line or sustainability, which is economics. And how do we relate to the land through our economies? So about that time in the 1930s, there is this reckoning on the land that farmers had been um, um, managing the land, um, not with, not with uh, you know, disdain or, or anger, but with a sense of not knowing exactly the best way to take care of the land as they do their farming practices. And we were losing topsoil um, by, the, the, by the millions of pounds and tons going down to uh, the Mississippi Gulf of Mexico. And this became critical in the early 1930s, it was recognized by the government that something needed to be done. They stepped in with the New Deal program administered through the Franklin uh, Roosevelt administration. And of course, many people know about the CCC uh, influence across the country, particularly in Wisconsin and uh, in the Coon Valley project. And so they built this watershed demonstration and tried to get every single landowner in that watershed, which is around 900 landowners, about 90,000 acres, enrolled in these practices to demonstrate what was possible. And not surprising that the science is really important and the practices are very uh, um, you know, uh, effective in controlling erosion. And yet it came down to social science, social interaction, sitting down with people uh, at kitchen tables and relating to them one-on-one -on -one about the problem and giving them a trusting uh, relationship that they could lean on in order to take this leap of faith and try something different and change the way they saw the land, change the way they did land management practices. Here's an image of the Driftless area from the Coon Valley area, 85 years later. And that mark 
that moment is still present on the land of those practices. You can see contour farming here. Uh, you can see strip farming. Uh, there's grassy waterways, and they all still exist. And so again, to pull our, our conversation back to the contemporary here, um, we are trying to have this same influence right now in Wisconsin with forest landowners. And we're doing it in part through a project called My Wisconsin Woods. And this is something that we have done in great partnership with Wisconsin DNR and others. Uh, and the, the reality is that when we look across the country, everything in green here is a privately owned tree. And so certainly on the Eastern half of the United States, if we are not effective in working with private landowners and engaging them in private forest management and taking them into the next century of care for their land through their forestry, we are not doing conservation on these forested acres. We have got to be effective in reaching private landowners. Right now, many of them are not engaged in cost share programs, which would help bring financial assistance. And I'm telling you, these programs are out there and quite frankly, easy to achieve, easy to uh, access, though there is a learning curve and there are some hesitations in, in working with the government, be it state or federal, nonetheless, uh, they're out there and they're supportive and people who use them come back and use them again. And I guarantee that's happening. And yet people don't really subscribe to them at a great rate. Likewise, with written management plans, many people don't have them. Uh, certifications is also not caught on real big. And so our effort through My Wisconsin Woods was to provide landowners convenience, first and foremost. How do we make this just easier? And so we like to say we're kind of racing to the bottom of the ladder, trying to find the lowest rung on the ladder that will get people started in understanding what they um, what they might be able to do on their property. And so everything that we're offering them is really built out of what we think is in their mind and their interest. And so our big buttons on the website are, I just bought some land, now what? We know people are buying property because of a romantic vision of, of having a 40 acres in Wisconsin uh, to hunt. Uh, they've got some vague idea of what they might like to do out there. Certainly it's a uh, recreation is a big part of that, but for a lot of them, it's just greenery. The rest of it is just greenery. And they don't know whether they got oak trees or ash trees or something in between. Uh, another button is how do I keep my woodland healthy? People are buying land to feel good about their own care of nature. They may not be able to articulate what that means. They not, may not be able to tell what the, you know, the top five things that they can do to make that happen, but caring for land and wanting it to be healthy is something that's on their mind. Certainly taxes and finances, that's another one of our big buttons. And then should I harvest my trees? And so these are questions that people come to us and we try to provide that customer support. Because again, as Don said in the opening, you know, I, 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 there was a chapter in my life when I was writing chapters for landowners on these handbooks called My Healthy Woods. And it felt great. And we thought, you know, we're gonna get this thing into the hands of landowners and the world is gonna change. And it just does not work that way. Uh, we've come to appreciate that. And this is again, out of the social sciences that there are these steps that people have to go through. Uh, and first is awareness. And then it's a want to learn more. And then it's take a first step. And then it's make a plan and then it's take an action. And so it really takes time and we have to stay connected with landowners over time in order to be effective with them. And so we've been very successful for, through the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and my Wisconsin Woods in brokering more visits. And so Don, again, mentioned this in the opening, but we have a goal with DNR and, and other partners a, a, across the state as well that are interested in private lands and private forestry uh, to have 20,000 visits over five years. We're three years into that. We've got 20 or we've got 12,000 visits with unengaged, previously unengaged landowners in Wisconsin. Uh, and we're well on our way to the 20,000. We think we're going to achieve it. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that partnership and what could come beyond that. So again, it's not just the visit, what comes next? How do we continue to engage these folks? How do we get the idea of plans in front of them? How do we get cost share in front of them? Things that can help them take the next step. So Leopold was also a landowner. And this is probably one of his sweetest chapters, uh, I would like to say, I would like to think anyway, uh, this came later in life. Uh, he was um, a professor and doing game management, uh, revered around the country for what he knew about game management. 
and I think look to for um, guidance and on a number of levels, both policy as well as practically. Uh, he had projects in the area that he was working on. And so to have this recreational property up in Baraboo, uh, living in Madison, I think was a really comfortable time in his life and one of great reflection. Uh, there were some warriors in here and from World War II. And so students were off fighting wars. And so he had more time for personal reflection and writing. So I think this was a very good chapter in his life. It didn't last nearly long enough. Uh, but the, this is uh, some shots of the of the historic property. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to get there, I encourage you to get there. Uh, this picture on the left hand side of the shack is um, is uh, how we uh, manage the property. That's our period of significance is around 1948 when he passed away. That was the shack as he knew it. So when we went to replace the roof recently, uh, rolled rubber roofing was we had, we had to do it on the on that shed part, the lean-to part of the shack there, uh, because that was what was in the image. And um, the roofer came by and said that that's exactly what you should have on there. The shake shingles that you had on there were holding too much moisture, and there was too much opportunity for rot. So this rolled rubber roofing was not only historically the correct thing to do, but the right thing for the building preservation. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a wonderful little spot and something that the family just came to really, really appreciate. Um, uh, for all that it was and all that it wasn't. So that, that uh, historic chicken coop uh, was there when they got there and Leopold turned around to his, his kids and said, this is perfect. And I think they were picturing something a little fancier and maybe on a lake, uh, it's not what they got, but uh, they got a whole lot more. Part of what they did up there was participate. And so as they did this work, uh, it really transformed them as people uh, that cared for the land and really knew what caring for the land meant uh, and how difficult it was. So in 1930s, late 30s, it is the drought years, uh, they were planting 3,000 pines a year, 99% of them in the journal, 99% of them died. And so they would keep coming back year after year uh, when we did our building project and, and used some of the trees from down there that they had planted. Uh, we counted the rings back and it wasn't until the early 40s that they really started to take off. But they had a great job, a great time participating on the land. Certainly observation was a big thing that they did. They kept phonology records and phonology is this record keeping of cyclic events. When's the robin first back? Uh, when do cranes leave on migration? When's the first hepatica bloom as he wrote about uh, as a kid uh, back to his mother when he was out in Lawrenceville and, and paying attention to wildflower blooms. And so they had this observation thing and so they are, there are phenological records from when Leopold was there in the 30s and 40s, uh, when Nina came back in the 70s, and now we keep those records uh, still today. And we have a phonology calendar that we offer up each year and it has become extremely popular. We're gonna sell over 5,000 of them this year. We have just a couple hundred left. So if you're interested in that, um, you, should, you should get to the Alba Leopold website and get yours ordered today. But they spent time out on the land just observing. And it was a, it was a, a real big family pastime. They had some funny uh, pets, squirrel, hawk, um, a crow, and an owl uh, that at various times were, were part of their family. Um, and here's Nina walking in the upper right-hand picture there with a guitar, a basket of food, a shotgun, uh, and homework. And you know it's gonna be a weekend when you got those things along. Um, and as Nina said, they always brought homework, but they never did it. And there was also this opportunity for reflection. And so many of the essays in, certainly in the almanac part, the, the first section of a Sand County almanac are place-based on the historic site. And so Drava and, and Bur Oak and, and some of those essays, the Good Oak, are from uh, the site. And this is a big reason why people want to come to the historic site to connect with the landscape that inspired this wonderful writing. And this reflection piece was really important to Leopold. Uh, these essays were his gems. I mean, he was really pouring a lot of creative energy into them and they meant a lot to him and he was getting them published. And so Marshall and Elegy, which I read to you to start with, uh, was published in uh, 1937 separately uh, from a Sand County Almanac, but then included in the essays as he started pulling the, the collection together. 
And this brings us to our last piece here in the, in the triple bottom line of society, economics, and uh, the environment. But he's getting to this ethical piece that is really important to him because it's about this relationship to the land and how do I capture this and how do I give it to the reader? And he did it in a brilliant way. I have purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. I mean, that is, that is unbelievably smart to say, I can't tell you what this land ethic is. It is up for all of us to decide and, and, and live out in our own ways and become part of this thinking community. And so he, he, you know, he's, he's having these conversations, he's writing these essays, um, and he's really diving into what it means to have this you know, ongoing thinking community that can embrace a land ethic. How are we gonna grow that? And through this collection of essays and his writing of a land ethic in here, he's trying to put it into words that is for the people. And this is not gonna sit on some scientific shelf that I want people to read this thing. I want people to understand what I see in nature and how important it is to me, but how important it can be to you and uplifting to you. And so we have, we have uh, inspired these conversations in, in, in myriad of ways over the years through the Leopold Foundation, but our goal is to engage the most number of people um, uh, as we can uh, in this idea of a land ethic and inspire this reflection of how people connect to the natural world. So Leopold is writing these essays. He's putting together this collection and he has a former student that he respects immensely, Albert Hochbaum. And he's in the upper left here. Uh, he's, he's the one on the right side of the upper left picture there. And he's sending these essays off to Albert and getting his take on them. And Albert is in a very powerful position to help Aldo, you know, you know, critique these essays. And he writes letters, there's, there's writing back and forth. And I'm gonna read some of these letters back and forth between Albert and Aldo. And this is from Albert to Aldo. And Albert writes, in many of these essays, you seem to follow one formula. You paint a beautiful picture of something that was a bear, crane, or a parcel of wilderness. Then in a word or epilogue, you sit more or less aside as a sage, deplore the fact that brute man has spoiled the things you love as this has never, this is never tiresome and yet it drives your point deep. Still, you never drop a hint that you yourself have once despoiled or at least had a strong hand in it. In your writings of the day, you played a hand in influencing the policies for your case against the wolf was as strong then as for wilderness now. I just read that they killed the last Lobo in Montana last year. I think you'll have to admit you've got at least a drop of its blood on your hands. And Aldo writes back and says, yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're kind of talking about literary effects and I think I'll kind of get that piece in there. Um, and Albert comes back, he, he's not having it. Albert comes back even stronger with another letter after Aldo kind of blows him off and writes this. Perhaps more than anything else, the series is a self-portrait of yourself. Let me say this by way of pointing to the blanks. You have told a good deal more about yourself in this series than you probably realize. But it seems to me that while you have covered your subject well, you have left obscure two of your strongest characteristics. One, of these is your unbounded enthusiasm, at least as it has impressed me for the future. The second characteristic is that your way of thinking is not that of an inspired genius, but that of any other ordinary fellow trying to put two and two together. Because you have added up your sums better than most of us, it is important that you let fall a hint that in the process of reaching the end result of your thinking, you have sometimes followed trails like anyone else that lead you up wrong alleys. That is why I suggest the wolf business. So Aldo, here's an image of the letters that um, 
Albert wrote to uh, uh, Alva Leopold. Leopold goes back to the desk, back to the pen, and writes what is arguably his most famous essay in a San County Almanac. And this is Thinking Like a Mountain. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim a steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then, full of triggerage. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. So Albert, uh, so Aldo Leopold has this collection of essays and he believes it is ready. And it is rejected, 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 rejected. He went through four rejections from major publishers and he was on his last straw. He could not take it anymore. He was asked, they were asking for revisions. They were complaining that it had these three sections. Uh, one was uh, the almanac part, and then we end with this philosophical thing. It just doesn't hold together. And he is giving over some of the editing responsibilities to his second son, Luna, uh, who's helping him because it is stressing him out. And finally, in 1947, um, he is engaging Oxford University Press. And in April, he gets a letter that says your book is accepted for publication. A week later, he is up at the shack uh, with his wife, Estella, and their daughter, youngest daughter, Estella Jr. And a fire breaks out down the road and they get in the car, grab the buckets and go down to help. And Aldo says to his wife, Estella, stay out here on the road, make sure it doesn't jump the road. Estella Jr., you go to the neighbors and call the fire department. And Aldo went in to fight the fire. Estella Jr. comes back and she sees this look of horror on the neighbor's face that was fighting the fire. And she knew something was wrong. And Aldo Leopold, a week after hearing his book was gonna be published, succumbed to a heart attack, was passed over by the fire and he was dead at age 61. And so he never saw a Sand County Almanac in publication. He never saw it in print. He never knew it by this title. I think that was another one of my teasers was what was Aldo Leopold's title for, for this collection of essays and it was Great Possessions. But the publisher thought it was too close to Great Expectations and so they changed the name. But out of respect for Aldo Leopold, they changed very little of the writing. They did very little editing. Um, just enough to, to, to make sure it was all correct, um, but otherwise didn't change the, the, uh, the, the book in any appreciable way. And a year after his death, it was published in 1949. It has since sold um, over 2 million copies. It's been published in 15 different languages. Uh, one of the more recent ones was Turkish. And we asked Ufuk, you know, why do you, why do you need this book? You know, what's, why is it important to you? And she said, my country needs this. Turkey, we have such a long human history. We have no idea what the land used to be. We have no idea how to care for it. It is just a commodity that we use. We don't, we, there, there's no relationship to the land like Aldo Leopold describes as possible in a Sand County Almanac. And so she really wanted it for her country. Out of that spot where Leopold died in 1948, uh, we built the Leopold Legacy Center out of trees that he and his family planted in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, it, was the, uh, it was the star project for the FSC certification that year. So we won the uh, national award uh, for all of the local wood that we put into it. Uh, there's about 90,000 board feet of um, uh, Leopold pine in the building. And um, uh, we were really proud of all that we were able to accomplish in bringing our own material 
uh, certainly this historic wood to this effort. Uh, when we pounded the last nail, it was the greenest building in the world. And we were very proud of that, but we also wanted to be beat and beat a lot. I mean, that is the idea is that many more people are doing this and it's not just the nonprofit world that's that taking these projects on for their novelty, but it is part of our society. We were started in 1982 by the children of Aldo Leopold. So here they are pictured. The only one um, that is still with us is Estella Jr. who is pictured in the middle there. All the others have passed, uh, but we still have family members that are very, very involved in our board. Uh, there are three permanent positions on our board for family members. And so although we're not a family foundation as we were back in those days um, and become more of a professional foundation, uh, we still very much have a connection with the family and, and adore that connection. Uh, we take all that Leopold did in his works uh, and it's many, many uh, writings beyond this. All of the archives have been digitized down in Madison and we co-serve um, that up to the public um, and, and try to uh, offer it up to all researchers and enthusiasts uh, worldwide through the digital archives at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We host thousands of people each year um, that come and visit us and uh, really want to connect again with this historic site. Uh, something that has been very fun for us in recent years is this crane spectacle. I mean, it is just by happenstance that in 1933 when Leopold is writing Marshland Elegy and there are literally three dozen cranes left in Wisconsin we now have 15,000 that roost behind his shack along the Wisconsin River. Uh, it is an amazing wildlife recovery story, but also one that connects to Leopold's history and writing. And so it's been fun to offer up trips like that, that people don't have to know who Aldo Leopold is to come to the site. And so we've had 400 people come through on crane tours this past fall. Uh, we've got virtual crane tour going on tonight actually. Uh, competing with this program, but there's a, there's one more this week. I can't remember if it's tomorrow night. I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow night, Thursday, yes, uh, that you could register for. If you're interested, go to our website and, and find it. Uh, but I'm going to leave it with Leopold's words, uh, because this is ultimately this idea of sustainability of the environment, society, and the economy coming together. And Leopold, not surprisingly, captured it in a few sentences. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. We use it, love and respect, um, that is sustainability. So with that, I encourage you to follow us, um, go to our website, uh, sign up for our e-newsletter, uh, find us on Facebook, find us on Instagram. We would love to have you in our circle. Uh, we've been very actively growing our circle, adding thousands of people each year, trying to grow the land ethic uh, through our connections to um, the thinking community. So thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Tom Giroux, I'll be facilitating the Q&A. There's nothing in the chat right now, so that means I get to ask my questions. Uh, and one is a comment. You had a slide with a couple of, of pictures of uh, his essays. And one is my favorite. I call it the mighty flambeau uh, about the Flambeau River. It is really uh, kind of a unique one. And, and I don't run across many people who've actually read it because it, I'm, I'm not sure it was ever really published widely other than in a few spaces. But it is really a commentary about the importance of public land uh, to the youth of the country and to the quality of the rivers. So it's really a unique piece. I don't know if you want to add anything more about the essay. Uh, I mean, I think you captured it well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that is the amazing thing about Aldo Leopold is, uh, and his writing is we, you just can't believe all the different people we have come through our doors and they all have picked out a little bit different piece um, of Aldo Leopold's history or his writing that really resonates with him. I mean, it was a very broad breadth of public lands, private lands, um, wilderness, wildlife, trees. I mean, there's just a little bit of something for everybody in Leopold's writing. 
Um, so the other question, this is more of a question. Uh, you talked about his first name, which I thought was really fascinating and I did not know uh, where it came from. So thank you for that. But I was curious about Aldo, is that a family name um, or oh. you don't know? <laughs> I don't. It just seems like an odd name, Aldo. Yeah. You know, of course, in that time period, there were, you know, people had different names. Uh, it just seems odd. I, I don't, I cannot think of another one. I mean, the, the family name that really got passed around a lot was Carl. Carl with a C because he had a dad, Carl, he had a brother, Carl, and he had a son, Carl. Um, I don't believe that there was another Aldo in the mix. Um, lots of comments. Everybody's loving it. Uh, um, someone commented that they didn't know uh, Aldo had come to the university and the Forest Products Lab, so that was interesting to a lot of people. Um, like I said, lots of uh, thank yous. Um, you know, the uh, interesting thing about your uh, uh, private landowner initiative is, you know, even though we need large public lands to be able to manage at a landscape scale, you really can't manage the total ecosystem unless you have partnership with private landowners. So I'll uh, second that wholeheartedly because, and, and getting people to work in concert with one another, like you did with your neighbor down there, is yeah. really what you need to do so that you're uh, kind of connecting the landscapes in a way that's important to wildlife. Yeah, I mean, about 60% of all the forest land in Wisconsin is privately owned, uh, millions of acres. Um, and yes, it is a daunting task that uh, it is 360,000 of them that own it, um, but there are, a, there's a smaller population within that. So if we just take the landowners that are 10 or more forested acres, it's about 180,000 landowners statewide. And that's the audience that we've been chipping away at. And so you might see our direct mail pieces if you're a forest landowner, uh, you might see our direct mail pieces under the uh, logo of, of My Wisconsin Woods offering up a property visit and um, that is the partnership with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Foresters. It has been, I think the other part of that project that has been really, really fun is, you know, partnership is something that everybody needs to say they're doing. Uh, but in my experience, very few people are doing it effectively. And I mean, that was as true for me and earlier in my career, but we have finally hit stride with some of these relationships um, where we are doing things that Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources would struggle to do um, because of bureaucracy. Like, for example, we maintain this My Wisconsin Woods website. I can change stuff right now. You know, on that website, I can, we are super nimble in how we manage that brand and make sure that it's effective. Uh, we don't have to go through a lot of, um, of uh, checks to, before we publish information. Um, and so we're very flexible that way. That would be that would be a level of effort that I'm not sure the DNR would be very uh, good at administering. Whereas the Aldo Leopold Foundation is never going to have a forester in every one of the counties, and so they offer up this uh, people power and uh, technical know-how and stability year over year of county foresters being being a resource uh, that is really pretty awesome. And whereas this audience is probably uh, pretty savvy and knows that they have a county forester that serves them, there are a lot of people that are just not aware um, that um, professionals, technical professionals like foresters and others are able to um, address their natural resource needs on their property and, and do walkthroughs for free. So, uh, so there's... So there is a question about the uh, location of the Aldo Leopold Check and the adjacent wildlife areas. Uh, I was trying to pull up a map, but maybe you could just describe where it is and, and how to get there. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I meant to do that when I had the, the map up on the screen, but we are like equidistant between Portage, Wisconsin Dells, and Baraboo. So if you can picture that triangle right there, we're right along the uh, Wisconsin River, just to the west of Portage. And I believe that interstate goes just south of you. Yeah, yep. We've got I-90-94 that is running just south of our property. And what's the name of the wildlife area? The Pine Island Wildlife Area. Yeah, so if you just went to the DNR website and Googled that, you'd come up with a nice map of the wildlife area that I'm sure has the Leopold land adjacent to it, so. Yeah. We don't publish too many maps of where the shack is and stuff like that. It's just that it, it, it doesn't need to be out there. People can come through us, but um, so you might not find too many maps of our property specifically, but. Uh, do you ever partner with the Nature Conservancy and Land Trust to protect forest lands? Well, we have definitely been part of the land trust, you know, effort when we can be. Um, and so some of our property is under easement, uh, much in the spirit of uh, what a land trust would be doing. Uh, more specifically with the Nature Conservancy, yes, we do partner with them. They're friends of ours. Um, most of it has been localized. And so we put on an oak workshop uh, for landowners because, of course, uh, the Nature Conservancy owns a big uh, nature preserve in the Baraboo Hills, and that's been a focal area for them because of the uh, contiguous canopy of forest there. And so they were very active in, in acquisition there and now are helping landowners manage. And so we put on a workshop in, in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, but of course they are a very worthy organization in our state and uh, a great partner to many. Uh, Leopold had enormous influence, uh, but not just through his writings, how many students' lives do you think he touched? Well, and not surprisingly, when people come through the door, they want they have traced back the lineage to how their professor was a professor was a student of a, a professor of a student of a professor that leads back to Leopold. Uh, so I'm sure it's in the thousands. Uh, but he had a few dozen students that went through his, his in in his um, career. that he directly supervised. Okay, like I said, uh, lots of accolades for the presentation. I think people are really happy with it. Uh, I did have one question earlier. Uh, will a, a link be available? Uh, Don, my ever helpful assistant here, is really good about downloading uh, the video or the recording to our YouTube channel at the Forest History Association. You can check us out on our website. And uh, so it'll probably be up sometime tomorrow. And uh, you can go ahead and send a link out to whoever you think needs to see it, particularly those private landowners. Yeah, great, I will do that. And if you are a webinar junkie, uh, as I assume you are, because you're on here tonight, you might as well sign up for one tomorrow night. I think our last virtual crane program is tomorrow night. Uh, and I encourage you to go to our aldoleopold.org website and sign up. I actually looked at my calendar to see if I had uh, tomorrow night open, and I do. And it sure beats uh, what's available on television, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, Stan Temple uh, is one of our senior advisors at the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and he is Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in wildlife ecology and held the chair during his career that Aldo Leopold once held. And he is a recent in inductee into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame. And he's the presenter tomorrow night uh, through that program. And you will like it. He, <laughs> you will be an expert in cranes after listening to Stan. I think we've, uh... I just have to check the Q&A. Sometimes people drop a question in there. And that's empty, so that's good. Um, I think we're good, unless you had any closing remarks. I, I think we've said it all. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And thank you, Don, for uh, inviting me and, and taking care of me while I was here. And I appreciate everybody that participated in the program tonight. Thanks, everyone. And don't forget to fill out your survey, which will be available right after the presentation. Thanks so much.